and was zipping up through the atmosphere. And as he did, he collided with something. And uh, this was all in what he would say would be the astral dimension. But uh, he found a, he encountered a craft there, and the occupants were just as startled with him as he was with them. And the conclusion that Greer comes to from this is that uh, ETs have that sometimes engineer things in the astral dimension. So uh, if you credit these accounts, there's a technology there and a lot we can learn about these other dimensions from looking at these cases. Uh, PK, of course, the Princeton Pear Lab has done a lot of wonderful experiments with PK. Um, and this is Ingo Swan's famous experiment where he was able to uh, influence a magnetometer that was heavily shielded where, that no one has ever been able to influence it before under any conditions, and he could pretty much cause it to go off scale at will. So the mind is able to affect these things. This is the uh, this is Rene Piox's uh, little baby chick experiment where he instrumented a um, a robot with a random event generator. And as we know from the other experiments, our mind is able to affect a random event generator. He used that as the steering mechanism and then had it bond with the baby chicks. So they thought it was their mother. So the top graph shows the path of the robot before any bonding has occurred. Uh, it's, a, oh, it's a view down into the pin where the robot is moving around making the, little, the random walk. The pin where the baby chicks are gonna be put is on the right hand side. In the lower figure, the only difference is the, the chicks have been bonded with the robot and have been placed in the cage. So apparently they're able to influence the random event generator that's doing the robot to cause it to hover, which uh, just shows that we aren't the only ones who can do this. Um, a lot of PK experiments are reported in contactee and abductee cases. Um, I'm going to move quickly along here, but ESP is of course one more area where we see um, evidence both from parapsychology research as well as from uh, uh, abductee and contactee cases that some kind of psychic communication goes on between the ETs and the humans. One of the fascinating things to me is that we all seem to have this ability even though most of us are not aware of it. This is an experiment by Lloyd uh, back in the 70s uh, looking at how the brain brain waves respond. The top trace shows when a tone is played and the brain wave uh, reacts with a certain pattern. The lower trace shows how the brain responds when someone sends the subject an ESP message. And even though the person was unaware that an ESP message had been sent to him, his brain waves showed a pattern that was almost identical to the top one. At the subconscious level, he knew that he had received a message. Unfortunately, most of us have so much chatter in our conscious mind that we're not really linked up in touch with those messages, but that's where meditation and hypnosis help a lot in allowing people to get more access. This is just Bob John's statement that these forces are anomalous. They, uh, they don't weaken with distance, they operate across time, and that tells us that something is needed, something is missing from our current science. Um, I think I'm probably running a little bit late here. How, how are we doing on time, Bob? Um, how much? Seven, Seven minutes, okay. Um, orbs are one more area that um, are kind of implied by the OBE uh, experiments. Um, today, people love to talk about orbs and show orb photographs. Um, of course, as, as we know, uh, many of those are probably artifacts. It's easy to get lens flare, it's easy to get bugs, it's easy to get dust in the near field of the camera that looks like an orb. So you can't always be sure that it's an orb. Uh, stereo photography or a few other ways uh, are, really help a lot in, in removing all those uh, anomalies. However, this is one, ex this is one picture that uh, shows, in my mind, a real orb. It's a daylight photograph taken by a friend of mine about four in the afternoon. Uh, you, you may not be able to see it from here, but it's about a three-foot diameter orb hovering in front of a cabin in the woods. And you can actually see the, the post, the support post of the front porch behind it, and also see light reflecting on it and from the ground. So it's a real three-dimensional object. Um, 
for several years I shared a haunted house with some friends in West Virginia. They had all kinds of strange phenomena there. On any given night you could get orbs and all kinds of other strange phenomena. Uh, with a well-known uh, Colorado ghost hunter, uh, we were photographing some orbs in the basement of a house he used to live in and I wasn't seeing anything and he was getting lots of stuff and I was getting a little bit crestfallen so he said he said out loud that it was totally dark and I have my little night shot Sony camera he said would an orb please show up for Claude's camera within about, within about two seconds an orb popped in right in the middle of my field of view I have a circle around it in the picture and the next 20 or 30 frames very leisurely moved toward me and to the right. I have about 30 frames of this orb as it moved toward me. So it was very cooperative and it convinced me that orbs sometimes show consciousness. Um, sometimes you see, you see vortices. This is an example of a vortex in the, in the attic of that same haunted house. Of course, in uh, ufology, uh, orbs are often reported. They often show up at the beginning of an abduction in the bedroom of the abductee. In the Betty's Andreas and Luca case, she saw a variety of orbs, including a large orb and several smaller orbs circling it over the pond. Interdimensional phenomena, one more example of this sort of bigger universe that we're being you know, given hints about in these cases. Uh, when you have a near-death experience, uh, the most common uh, reported phenomena is a tunnel, a tunnel that opens up and that becomes your gateway to the other side, the, the heaven or the, the, the being of light. Uh, and on the, in that tunnel you'll often encounter uh, relatives, departed loved ones. And this is a painting from Hieronymus Bosch hundreds of years ago uh, showing the same thing. In UFO cases some people report tunnels opening up in their walls where Sometimes spooky ETs come out. Uh, when Bob Monroe used to have his out-of-body experiences, uh, he would often, uh, as he began the experience, he would roll over and a hole would show up at his wall. He would go through it into another dimension. Um, teleportation, again, these are, I'm going to have to move quickly. Uh, we have a variety of examples. My book has a whole chapter on teleportation. And uh, this is another area where you find a lot of, uh, in UFO cases, uh, levitation. I have a chapter on levitation in, in my book as well. Uh, saints are often reported uh, with high credibility by hundreds of witnesses. Uh, there have been a number of seemingly credible cases in parapsychology as well. Um, David Dunglass uh, Hume was one of the most famous. Uh, Sir uh, William Crook studied him for many years in England. Of course, UFOs levitated is one of their most obvious features. I'm going to move along here. So uh, basically we're, we're finding that a lot of puzzles are showing up. The time can be twisted. People can travel through time, at least in the remote viewing sense. Uh, and then what happens if you change the timeline? And therefore there's something that permanent that happens when you do change the timeline. Um, so what, what I'm trying to look for here is a model that is flexible enough and big enough to be able to account for the wide range of phenomena. Here's an example of a Qigong master who you can measure his chi being projected across the room 30 feet away. And he's also able to affect this, the uh, hydrogen bonding of water hundreds of miles away from where he's working. Okay, so, and we need a theory. And um, the last chapter of my book, Synchronized Universe, uh, talks about this theory. Basically, it's a non local model which uh, provides a way for nearby particles to interact with the distant matter of the universe. And if you allow that interaction to have a backwards in time component, which is what the old Feynman Wheeler model did, so that things can operate backwards in time as well as forwards in time, then the entire system can become coupled together. And that's where the synchronized universe model idea comes from. When the orbits of particles are synchronized, the whole thing breaks down into one system which is synchronized and sees other particles which are synchronized with it as its universe. There could be many, many other systems with a different synchronization. They'll be invisible. They'll only contribute quantum noise. They'll be invisible. So you have parallel universes that very naturally show up in this model. It's as though we live our life on a sheet of paper, which is our 